My name is Heath Lambert. I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church, and I want to welcome you to a celebration of Christmas. We are really thankful that you are here. I want to let you know what we are doing here. Our purpose for being here tonight as a church is that you would trust in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We want to exalt his name and his work at this season of the year. It's at this season of the year that we acknowledge that his perfect sinless life began with a birth of a virgin in Bethlehem. And that is a cause for celebration. When you read in the New Testament, everybody who hears about the birth of the baby in Bethlehem, they stop what they're doing and they fall down and worship him. And so every Sunday this Christmas season, we have been worshiping Jesus uh, on Sunday mornings with our choir and our orchestra. We've been going through a special sermon series talking about why we sing the songs we sing at Christmas to fuel our worship at this season of the year. We've had a number of special musical events. We had a children's concert a couple of weeks ago. We had some special guests, Michael O'Brien and the Photo Sisters last week. And this week is uh, the Christmas concert that so many of you wait uh, throughout the year for. We are really, really glad that you are here. I want to be sure you know uh, that we would love for you to join us next week on Saturday evening. We're going to have our special Christmas Eve candlelight service. And then the culmination of our Christmas celebrations are, of course, going to be on Christmas Day, Sunday morning. We'll meet together as a congregation and begin the Christmas Day at 1045, celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. It is our heart's desire that you would join with, with us in worship from the Spirit and worship and in truth. Uh, I don't want you to think of tonight just as a concert. We want you to think of tonight as an opportunity to worship Jesus and draw nearer to him and know him more and love him more than you did when you came in tonight. And so towards that end, I am going to pray for us. Would you pray with me? Father, we are thankful for Jesus Christ. We are thankful for his birth in a manger of a virgin. We are thankful for his sinless life his sacrificial death, his glorious resurrection, and his current seat in glory in heaven. Father, as we stop what we're doing tonight to remember the birth of Jesus, I pray that you would give us the gift of faith and grant us to have hearts full of trust in Jesus. I pray as we listen and as we join in singing that from the bottom of our hearts we would mean the words that we encounter tonight. I pray you'd strengthen our faith. I pray you'd grow our love. I pray that you would strengthen the testimony of the churches in Jacksonville. And we pray that tonight and throughout the rest of our lives, Jesus Christ would be exalted. And we pray it in his name. Amen. Really hope you enjoy the Christmas celebration.
Well, welcome and Merry Christmas to you. What a very special evening it is going to be tonight. I hope you've already begun to get a sense of what we are trying to do, and that is to make you so incredibly excited about Christmas that you can't stand it. And that's what we hope happens tonight. You've got one week, and it's Christmas Day. So we are right there on the threshold of one of the most exciting moments of our year. And what we want to do is just sort of invade that space where the adrenaline rushes and, and where all the anticipation lies. And we want to give it a message, a message that gives you the reason, the true reason for all that excitement. And that is the gift of Christ to our world. For all of the lights and all of the packages and all of the food will pass away. But what Christ offers is eternal. And what we are talking about here tonight are eternal things. And we have two very special guests that are joining us this evening to help share in that. You've already been introduced to them musically. In just a moment, we'll have a little more time to get to know our featured soloist, Heather Payne, as we talk to her about her life, a remarkable career with Point of Grace, and the opportunity God gave her to minister through music for many, many years. And she's going to continue that career of sorts by ministering tonight and sharing through music this incredible message that is Christ and his gift of life. Our dear friend Daniel Cruz is also here tonight. We're so thankful for Daniel. We've, he's been a friend of First Baptist for many years, and he will be joining us at different points along the way as well. But before we get to those things, we have a very exciting arrangement of a very traditional Christmas carol that we want to share with you. And while it will look like there's fire on the stage, nothing is lit, I promise. It's just lighting effects. So don't come up here with a fire extinguisher and try to put something out. But enjoy Carol of the Bells.
Well, I wanted to invite Heather on the stage for just a few minutes of a, a bit of a little mini interview. How many of you were fans of or listened to Point of Grace at some point in your Christian life? Yeah? So you now no doubt know who Heather is. And so I just thought it'd be neat for our congregation to hear a little bit about how that all happened. So first of all, how did you get involved in music to begin with? Well, it's probably the story that many of you have who love music. I was raised in a musical home with music all around. You know, my parents are both singers and my sister's a singer and my instruments were everywhere. And it was just, you know, a lot of music surrounded us. And my whole life, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And, you know, you have high and lofty ideas when you're younger. And my teenage self, I remember very vividly walking through Dillard's and, and seeing these really sparkly, beautiful dresses and thinking, one day I'm going to wear that dress to the Grammys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to buy my Grammys dress at Dillard's. <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, I think back then you don't really, you know, you just have these great ideas of, of what it could be, but will it really happen? And who knew that one day I would actually go to the Grammys, you know? And yeah, we didn't win a win. We didn't win a Grammy, but we did. But we were nominated, and we did get to go, which was did an amazing opportunity. Did you buy your dress at Dillard's for the Grammys? I did not buy okay. my dress at Dillard's, but I'm giving Dillard's a big shout out here. So, <laughs> but I think just. You know, music surrounded our family, and I say that to parents even that are here today who have kids that maybe not, maybe talented in music, maybe talented in theater, maybe talented in engineering, maybe talented in, in a, min, a million different things. But when you see that your child has a talent in whatever area it is, encourage them in that, in that gift. Encourage them to be the best that they can be and spur them on and pray for them. And you just don't know what God's journey is going to be for them. Yeah, so parents, make sure you get your kid a drum set for Christmas this year. <laughs> Sorry. <'cause they> need <laughs> Point of Grace was founded in 1991 and by many accounts kind of rode the wave of the, of the popularity of contemporary Christian music. There are some that will say that Point of Grace may have been the most successful of any group that was formed during those years. Certainly among the top. Uh, we have um, numerous Dove Awards, so I'm looking... Uh, up here, and just the numbers are staggering, 16 Dove Award nominations, six of them uh, they won, including a group of the year for two years, 94 and 95, uh, and then uh, there was just this delight with who Point of Grace was, not only musically, because they were an extraordinary musical ensemble, but ministry, they had a heart to reach many, especially teenage girls. So talk a little bit about what it was like to be in those Point of Grace years. Yeah, well, you know, even piggybacking off of the fact that I I was able to do what I loved as a, a living in a ministry, I had I had the amazing privilege to be able to not just use a gift that the Lord has given me, but to use it for Him, and that is the greatest gift that I could ever have had. And then I and then I got to do it with three girls that I absolutely love, two of which I grew up, grew up with in Norman, Oklahoma. We knew each other since grade school. And then we met the other one, um, Shelly, at Washita Baptist University in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. That's a mouthful. Um, and we were college students there. And, and for him was a, do y'all remember who, y'all remember for him? Okay. Well, they were a group. They had come out and we were, we loved for him. And we thought we could be a girl for him. Not for her. That's what everybody said for her. No, definitely not. It does not work that way, yeah. But we, so we just decided to see if we sounded good together. So we just traipsed over to the music building at Washita and started plunking out some notes and some harmonies just to see if we sounded okay. And we were like, I think we could do this. So we started just singing at everything we could sing at. We did banquets, we did parties, we did churches, we did revivals, we did anything that anybody would have us come do. And then Terry's grandmother heard about this seminar in Estes Park, Colorado, where Christian artists go and they meet record companies. And so she paid for us to go. 
we went and we competed in the group category and we won the group category, which did absolutely nothing for us. But what it did do was we were introduced to some amazing people up there. And we met a, a guy named John Mays from Word Records, who was our A&R guy. So he ended up signing with Word Records, and he brought us to Nashville, and, and the rest is history. Yeah. And it's a great history. And it has an interesting turn for you uh, because there were many that would say that the years, the 90s, the 2000s, were just the best years for contemporary Christian music. And uh, you made a... You made a decision in 2008 that changed everything for you. Talk about that decision. I did. You know, um, I had four kids in five years. And after I had had my fourth um, biological child, because we have adopted a son since we had our Ava. Um, Ava was about four months old. And I will, um, let me say this because I want to honor my husband. He's here tonight. And I want to honor him because he, he was the most supportive husband in what I got to do, and he would travel with us when he could. He was working on his PhD the whole time, and sometimes one of the kids would stay home with him, and the rest would go with me, or, if, you know, different things. We had all different kinds of scenarios, but one thing that he did was he said, I will never ask you to leave Point of Grace, but what I will ask you to do is when God says it's time, I ask that you will be obedient, and I, I, I will say this. There was a point in my life that the thought of leaving Point of Grace was just a nightmare for me. I couldn't even imagine the day that I would leave it because I loved it so much. I loved the girls. I loved getting to meet all the people and sing these amazing songs. And I loved the harmony. That was the most amazing thing for me. But we were at the Dove Awards in 2008. We were up for, uh, we were singing on the Dove Awards. We were up for um, the song, How You Live. That was the song that I sang. And we were up for an award that night. And that won, won the award. We were backstage in our dressing room. We were sharing a dressing room with Amy Grant that night. And we were, um, we were back there. And our managers came in. And they said, hey, we want you guys to go out to California for about a month. And we want you to meet with just you know, no concerts. She was just going to go and meet with all the different country radio stations. And I was like, wait, country radio stations? And they were like, yeah, because How You Live is getting some country music play. And so we want to see if we can kind of get it going. And uh, my heart starts palpitating. And I'm thinking, I don't want to go to California to meet country radio people because that's not what I do. And so I, it was that moment that the Lord released me. I never would have dreamed it would have been backstage at the Dove Awards. But I said to them right there, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. My husband has no idea <laughs> that I'm saying this. But I, I'm done. I think I'm done. And so I went away, went, left the dressing room, called my husband up. He was on his way down from Louisville, Kentucky to the Dove Awards. And and I said, hey, I need to tell you something. And he goes, okay. And I said, I just retired. <laughs> and he was really quiet. <laughs> and then he took a deep breath and he said, okay, okay. And here's what's amazing. And, you know, I, I know that we all, when we look through our lives, we see God working in, through providence. He does. He works through providence. And I got my last official paycheck one week, and the very next day, he graduated with his Ph.D. and began his journey as a professor at uh, Voice College at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And, you know, it was just, the timing was so beautiful, and the Lord just was so faithful and good to us. And I had, have not had one minute of regret. Not one. It's incredible. And just as a reminder to follow God wherever he leads, and sometimes that's different than we think he's leading us. This is not your first time at First Baptist. No. In fact, we were kind of digging through some old files, and we <laughs> found the record of your first visit uh, to uh, First Baptist, and it was... Uh, right. 2005. 2005. That's right. On the Winter Wonderland Tour. That yes. was the year you released, I think, your second Christmas second album. Second Christmas album that I was a part but of, yes. But most people will say it was your best because well, they love that album. It's a good one, but I will say, of all of our records, my, our Christmas records, they're my favorites. They are my absolute favorites. Well, since it's Christmas time, we thought we should sing some of the original Point of Grace music. So we have a founding member of Point of Grace. We just needed to come up with the rest of the group. So 
we handpicked a few members of our ministry team. And so we have Point of Grace, First Baptist style. Yes. Coming to sing a couple of selections.
Dreams continued as they had been while a newborn softly cried. But the heavens wrapped in wonder knew the meaning of his birth in the weakness of a baby. They knew God had come to earth. As his mother held him closely, it was hard to understand that this baby, not yet speaking, was the would not believe they would hate him and in anger they would nail him to a tree But the sadness would be broken as the song of life arose. And the firstborn of creation would ascend and take his throne. He had left it to redeem us, but before his life Would you please stand and join us as we sing two angel carols.
Great job. Your job singing there. Thank you. You may be seated. We are going to uh, get Heather up here to sing a couple of songs that, uh, that are really just demonstrative of, of her gift for singing, but also of just the variety of styles that we get to celebrate Christmas with. So I hope you really enjoy two very contrasting songs, one soulful gospel song and one classical setting back to back. So give you a whiplash, musical whiplash if you're not paying attention, but enjoy.
Nothing quite says the full meaning of Christmas like that song. As you deep, dive deeply into those lyrics, you recognize that this is truly not just a silent night, it is a holy night. 
And this next song pulls it all together as we describe the full meaning of the birth of Christ in that night in Bethlehem. And for this, we're going to ask our dear friend, Daniel Cruz, to join us as we sing the glorious reality that not only was he born, you can welcome Daniel. I know you love him. You want to say you're grateful for him. I'm grateful for him as well. It, it doesn't just celebrate the birth, but it celebrates the entire life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And it reminds us that even now, he lives.
Wow. <laughs> Daniel, it has been so fun singing with you. Thank you so much for letting me sing with you. And choir, you guys, and orchestra, y'all are blessed. You are so, so blessed. It is the most wonderful time of the year. You know, I was just out at the town center, went out there to do a little Christmas shopping, and you guys have a great place to shop. And I, I was telling Mary and Lauren, I love the hustle and bustle of Christmas time. I love being in the middle of all the people, just like hitting each other's shoulders and getting in line, and I'm a weird person. I like all of that. <laughs> and it seems like everybody's in pretty much of a good mood, but as much as it's such a wonderful time, and for many the most wonderful time of the year, for so many more, just like Pastor Keith said this morning, it is the hardest time of the year. It brings up bad memories. It brings up heart-breaking things. And whether it's a loss of a loved one or just a bad memory, this is not the most wonderful time of the year for many people. And why is that? It's because we live in a broken world, right? This world is broken. But the reason that we have hope and the reason that in the midst of the sadness, and just like you said this morning, Heath, it was so beautiful for you to share your story and then for you to be up there just rejoicing in Christmas and what the whole meaning of Christmas is. And it's because it's about the hope of the gospel, right? It's about the hope that God did what he said he was going to do when he sent his son Jesus. And he gave us hope so that when we have all these trials and tribulations, whether it's at Christmas time or any other time of the year, what is the true cure for despair? It is to behold. It is to behold Christ. It is to behold him. It is to behold the risen Savior, our King, our King of Kings, the one is, that is the wonderful Counselor, the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace, and He does reign forevermore. So when we get in these deep times of despair, and we all have those moments, it's not just at Christmas time, and it's not just people that have experienced loss, we all have these moments. But when we do that, if we can just lift our heads and behold Christ, that's the answer, beholding him. She put up the tree, stockings one, two, three. They all know what is missing. It's been a whole year without him right here. Won't be the same kind of Christmas. Some years it's wonder and lights in the sky. Some years it's okay.
This next song is a very special song to me. I had the privilege of singing it on tour with Michael W. Smith. It's a song that he wrote. And I also had the privilege of recording it with him. And um, it was one of those moments, I don't know how many of you have ever been in a recording studio, but emotion matters and how you feel about the song and the connection, even in a recording studio, it matters. And I was living in Louisville, Kentucky. I was having to drive down to Nashville. And um, the Bible study that we did the night before I went down was in Ephesians 2. And it felt kind of random. And I, I have read Ephesians. My husband has taught Ephesians. And I've heard this passage so many times about us being dead in our trespasses and sins. But for some reason, that night, those two words that make all the difference in the world in that passage, but God, just, I mean, they overwhelmed me that night. But God, even though we were dead, he made us alive together with him, with Christ. And I felt that to my very being, and then I drove down to Nashville the next day, and I was still feeling it. And I remember getting in the, the studio and sitting down with our, with our producer and just kind of telling him about this verse that just exploded into me. And I don't know if he got it. I don't know if he felt the same way I did. But I had this moment, and I got in that studio and for some reason, this song that I have sung literally hundreds of times became brand new to me. Because here's the thing, you guys. My family's been doing the Advent and reading all the, the prophecies of the Old Testament, telling us that the Christ was coming. And because of that, God did what he said he was going to do. He sent his son he did what he said he was going to do. He sent his son. He's going to do. He has done what he said he would do. He's going to do. He is doing what he said he's, what he's doing, right? He's doing what he said he would do. And he's going to do what he said he would do. Amen? He is faithful to do what his word says it will be accomplished to the glory of God the Father. And because he did what he said he's going to do, he sent his son to the world so that we could be saved, so that we could have eternity with him if we trust and believe in him. All is well. <laughs> it's as simple as that. All is well. And I remember singing this song years back at our church in Kentucky, and one of my friends came up to me afterwards and she said, I think it should be like, I think you should title this, this tour that you're doing, All Is Well, So Go and Tell. That's how it should be, right? All is well for those of us who believe, so we should be going and telling the world who Christ is, what he has done for us, what he can do for them, that he can save them, share the gospel of Jesus Christ for them and watch their lives be transformed. All because all is well.
I want to thank you for coming tonight to this Christmas celebration. I hope it has been as much a blessing to you to hear it as it has been to us to prepare it and present it this evening. This time of year, Christmas, is a remarkable time in the midst of what often is a chaotic season of life. In fact, years just tend to roll into one another uh, with all of the challenges that go from one to the next, and Christmas kind of gives us a chance to breathe and recognize that uh, we can carve out some space to reflect on what matters most. And Christmas indeed gives us that opportunity. As we've just sung, all is well, we're recognizing that in that moment, that first Christmas, there in the context of that stable in Bethlehem, with the perfect Son of God in the form of a baby, having just been born and in a manger, and Mary and Joseph and the shepherds surrounding him, all indeed was well. Everything was just right. And it was the perfect demonstration of the love of God to mankind. Now there was a lot going on in the world around Bethlehem. In fact, in Bethlehem itself, there would have been difficulties and challenges. All was not well in the world, but in that moment, in that stable, it was perfectly well. One of the great hymns of the faith plays on the same theme, singing the phrase, it is well with my soul. The hymn writer of that particular song wrote that in the place of one of the greatest trials and tribulations anyone could imagine. He had just lost all four of his children to a tragic accident at sea. All was not well in terms of his circumstances. But he writes in that hymn, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. So in the midst of that moment, in such great loss, he was able to say, and then leave us the words to say, all is well. It's well as it needs to be well. How can that be? Well, Christmas is a great time to assess that. Whatever's going on in your world, whatever's going on in your life, what matters is what matters in eternity. What matters is what have you done with that baby in a manger? Of course, the story doesn't end in the manger. It just begins there. Jesus, having been born in a manger, lived a perfect life as a young man and into his early adulthood began a ministry, taught, healed, did everything exactly as the Father intended. Never committed a sin. He was tempted in every way, just like we are, but he didn't give in to sin. In fact, he was perfect, the only one who's ever lived a perfect life. No sin, no hint of disobedience to the Father. And yet he was punished. He was sentenced to die on a cross. He was hung on that cross. He bled and died. He died one of the most torturous deaths one could imagine physically. In fact, the torture instrument that is the cross is probably the most heinous instrument of uh, trial and death that one could have conceived of. But that's not the worst part of what he experienced. He also experienced the wrath of God. The wrath of his own father for sin was poured out on him for punishment, but not for his wrongdoing, for ours. For he took upon himself the sins of mankind, and he gave his life as a sentence of death for those who would place their faith in him. So how can all be well, even in the midst of a chaotic world? By placing faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, it can be well with you, but you must do what the Apostle Paul has told us to do in his writings. Examine yourself to see if you are a part of the faith. Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? That's what matters. Look at your own life. Have you confessed that you are a sinner, repented of those sins, and asked Jesus to forgive you and to be the Lord and Savior of your life? That's how all can be well. That's what matters this Christmas. If you take a moment tonight, even in these moments as we conclude this concert, and think about your relationship with God, ask yourself that question, have I repented and trusted in Jesus for salvation? If you have, celebrate Christmas for all it's worth. If you have not, 
enjoy the perfect gift of Christmas, the gift of life and that more abundantly. Enjoy the gift of Jesus Christ that he came to give you so that you could have relationship with the Father and that you could have hope for all eternity. And in that respect, absolutely, this Christmas, all will be well. Well, I want to thank you one more time for being here this evening. We have one more song to share with you as we cap off this evening of Christmas celebration. But I want to reiterate what you heard on the video. God gives us these moments of grace in our life where we see things a little bit more clearly than ever before. And I want to encourage you, if that's you tonight, where you see clearly your sin and your need for hope through a Savior named Jesus Christ, that you seize the opportunity this evening to respond to that invitation. We don't know what happens tomorrow, but we know right now the offer of free grace, the offer for life and that more abundantly is being extended to everyone here in the room and to all those watching online. Jesus died so that you could live, and I want to pray that you'd have the faith to respond to that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this evening and the opportunity to celebrate the gospel, to celebrate Jesus. That's what it's all been about. Our celebration this evening is not about a date on the calendar. It's about a person, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And I pray that he has been properly exalted. And I pray that the message that he came to bring and to secure the gospel message, the good news that even though we were indeed once dead in our trespasses, we can be made alive in Christ, but only in Christ. And I pray for those who are here tonight who are contemplating this free offer of grace, that you would give them faith to respond. Help them even in these moments to repent of their sins, to ask you to forgive them for wrongdoing and to place eternal faith in the perfect person and work of Jesus Christ, believing that he indeed lived on this earth, born in a manger, of a virgin, lived that perfect life without sin, was nailed to a Roman cross for sins that he did not commit, but he took the punishment upon himself died, was buried in a tomb, and was raised again on the third day, showing that he had conquered sin and death. Would you grant faith to believe and transformation this evening? In Jesus' name, amen. Quick reminders of what Pastor Heath has already shared. Christmas Eve service will be in this room Saturday evening at 5 o'clock. We want to invite you back to celebrate a very special event and then Sunday morning, we're here to worship at 1045, again, back in this room. We'd love to have you with us. If you are not in a church right now, not in a place where you can celebrate these important days, please join us here. As we conclude our concert this evening, we trust that you will have the most glorious and happy holidays, the most merry Christmas, and the most God-honoring, faith-building time of your life. I hope you enjoy.
the world tries to tell you differently. But I believe that miracles can still happen. Just when it seems impossible, the unexpected happens when you least expect it. Once upon a time, on a dark and cold winter's night, I saw a bright star shining from the east, and I followed it. All of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appeared and said, Do not be afraid, for I bring good news of great joy for all mankind. Today, a Savior has been born to you, and He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find this baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests.
We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Good tidings we bring to you and your kin. Good tidings for Christmas and a Happy New Year. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy Merry Christmas. Thank you so much.